All of the pictures you're going to see are patients that have been in my office. And um, uh, so I kind of grade them by the New York Times crossword puzzle. Yeah. Is it a Monday puzzle that's relatively easy, or is it a Saturday puzzle that's impossible? And this would be more on the Saturday puzzle side. That you see scars from bilateral knee replacement surgery, you see um, some obesity, you see some cellulitis, and you see some lymphedema. So we're going to go through. Uh, just some basic definitions here uh, of edema, some of which you just heard. Uh, venous edema is excess but protein-poor fluid that's trapped in the interstitium, leaked from capillaries, and not absorbed by either the uh, venous or lymphatic systems. Contrasted with lymphedema, which you just heard about, we all know is a protein-rich interstitial fluid that's resulting from some sort of lymphatic disruption. And lipedema is abnormal fatty deposition, uh, which we're going to hear plenty of. So I tell my, this is a condensed version of a one hour talk that I give for CME credit to physicians in my area. And when I tell them, you know, we, we taught in medical school, when you hear clippity-clop, clippity-clop hoof beats, let's think about horses before we get to zebras and unicorns. So the most common cause of edema in anybody over the age of 50 is venous insufficiency. And classically, we're taught that that means valvular reflux. But I'm going to show you that it, many of those patients, maybe half of patients that we think of venous insufficiency, really have venous obstruction. And this is not a fluid overload state. It's not one that should be treated with diuretics. But in contrast, in the uh, younger population, in a premenopausal woman, for example, the most common cause of edema is idiopathic edema. Now, this is not cyclic edema. It's not premenstrual edema. This occurs throughout the cycle and is defined as an excess of 1.4 liters of fluid that accumulates throughout a 24-hour period. For this condition, a gentle diuretic such as spironolactone is appropriate. So where would I start with this uh, patient here? Uh, I want to break things down. Is it acute? Is it chronic? Acute meaning 72 hours or less. Is it one side or both sides? Do I think this is primarily medical or mechanical or some part of both? So again, the causes of bilateral lower extremity swelling, the most common thing is venous insufficiency, then idiopathic edema, but there's a whole list of other things, and my medical colleagues need to be reminded of pulmonary hypertension and pelvic venous compression, lip edema, lymphedema, diuretic abuse, and a whole host of drugs whose side effect is lower extremity edema. Congestive heart failure, for which they love to prescribe Lasix, is a legit diagnosis, but really only counts for less than 1% of patients with bilateral lower extremity edema. Now, I don't know how well this projects, but this is a 16-year-old boy whose right leg is more than twice the size of his left leg. This would be a unicorn, actually. Uh, he has venous insufficiency, but he also was born with a congenital variant of klippel trenani syndrome, which is characterized by deep vein abnormalities and osteohypertrophy. So his leg, all the bones in his right leg are twice the size of the bones in his left leg. He's never been able to participate in sports. He never wears shorts. He doesn't really go outside or have any friends. He has to get uh, a different size shoe for each foot. Our time frame is also important. Are we talking acute or are we talking chronic? And you've seen all these diagnoses before, but this is how I would sort that out. Uh, I do like to do um, surgery, so I'm much more interested in finding mechanical causes for leg swelling. I like things that are leaking or, I don't know which one's working here. I like things that are either leaking or blocked that I can put a catheter in and open up or close down. But I am conscious of the drugs that are very commonly prescribed. How many of you in here are on calcium channel blockers or are on some kind of hormone replacement therapy, corticosteroids, estrogen, testosterone, even simple NSAIDs like ibuprofen or the proton pump inhibitors, any of the purple pills, all can cause bilateral lower extremity swelling. And very often, patients you know, will have a variety of leg complaints, and, and the reflex is to put them on Lyrica or Gabipentin, which can may, maybe exacerbate the swelling. So let's go through some of these uh, examples. This is classic venous insufficiency, and I don't know how it projects, but you can tell by the nail polish this is a woman. At first glance, you would think these are male legs. 
She's got massive varicose veins. She displays uh, some of the criteria of edema, skin thickening, stasis dermatitis, and some early hemosiderin deposition. She's not yet at the more advanced uh, phase of venous insufficiency where she would have lipodermatosclerosis or bleeding or ulceration, and we want to prevent her from getting there. So what is venous insufficiency? So um, the reflux or valvular reflux cause of venous insufficiency is due to leaky valves in our veins. We have very delicate one cell layer thick uh, valves in the veins that have to open up and close. They're check valves. They have to let blood flow into muscle, and then the muscle pumps the blood uphill against gravity. And these valves are under extraordinary pressure. If the valves leak, the blood refluxes backwards and outwards to the skin and manifests as varicose veins or um, spider veins, reticular veins. Historically, the mainstay of treatment for this type of uh, venous insufficiency has been compression and elevation. Europe is a bit ahead of us in using venotonic agents, but there are some supplements available here, horse chestnut, butcher's broom, and uh, vascularia. So here's what has been perfected over the past 15 years to eliminate the most common cause of venous insufficiency like the legs I showed you. And that is, you can see fiber optic laser inside the saphenous vein and we're going to fill the saphenous space with tumescent anesthesia and laser ablate that saphenous vein. It's a very common, very simple, very easy procedure. And then we're going to numb up the veins that are marked out here and make three to five millimeter micro incisions, harvest the varicose veins, stereostrip compression bandage, patient walks out under his or her own power and is back to normal activities within 48 to 72 hours. This has been perfected and is a great procedure for venous insufficiency. It's a typical result. Again, without the nail polish, you wouldn't know that that was a woman's leg, uh, but it is. So venous insufficiency due to reflux, compression, venotonic agents, and a variety of surgical methods uh, that are uh, very minimally invasive to eliminate the source of reflux. Of course, the number one worry when somebody sees a swollen leg is, oh my God, is this DVT? And this lady uh, demonstrates a, an example of a DVT that was missed, not treated, and then she came back to the ER with a, a, a dramatic complication of DVT that we call phlegmasia cerulea dolens. She's clotted from her inferior vena cava to her toes. And the pressure here in her leg is, is phenomenal. So here's a catheter. Sorry, go back. Catheter in a tibial vein at her ankle, at the medial malleolus, and the injection of contrast shows her tibial veins in her calf are filled with thrombus. Here's the kneecap for reference. Here's the femur, thigh bone. There's just ghosting of contrast around her femoral vein, which is completely filled with clot. And then here's the inguinal ligament or groin crease, and there's really no flow getting through the iliac veins into her inferior vena cava. So this is treated with an overnight infusion of clot buster, TPA, you've heard about it, used for stroke and heart attack, and it's great for uh, lysing or dissolving these massive uh, clots in the leg. And here it is the next morning. The iliac veins are almost cleared out and opened up with a stent. Come on. So the treat. It's going to go back again. Anyway, we're going to get this right. The treatment for DVT or deep venous thrombosis is some form of heparin, either in the hospital or on an IV, or and on an IV, or as an outpatient getting injections. And then after a certain period of time, it's safe to convert over to an oral anticoagulant. Compressionos are important. Uh, I tell my DVD patients I want you in compressionos for two years, every day for two years, to try to prevent what I'm going to show you next is post phlebitic syndrome. And I tell my uh, physicians that consider calling for uh, TPA or clot buster infusion in patients where the DVT is proximal in the femoral veins of the thigh or the pelvic veins. So here's a gentleman with a swollen leg that he's had for several years. 
And at first glance, you might think it's just all due to that incompetent perforating vein right there, and maybe this is all due to reflux. He displays uh, more pronounced findings of stasis dermatitis and hemosiderin deposition. But further up his leg, he's got hemosiderin above this refluxing vein. So it doesn't all fit. It's not just due to reflux. And indeed, he had had a DVT 10 years earlier, and his iliac vein was totally occluded. So he had reflux insufficiency, yes, but the cause was venous hypertension from proximal obstruction in the pelvis. These are all collateral veins in the pelvis that are draining the leg. And then um, through endovascular techniques, I can get through these obstructed veins, stent them, and now when I inject, the collateral flow is obliterated and he has an open uh, iliac vein to drain the leg. So PTS, or post-thrombotic syndrome, is not well understood, but it's a very common cause of these painful, swollen legs with dramatic skin changes. Prevention is really better than trying to fix it. Prevention with good anticoagulation and compression. Um, skin care is important to avoid minor trauma and infection. And then intervention with stenting to relieve obstruction when possible. So now we're going to talk about pelvic venous compression without any history of DVT. There are a variety of ways this is described in the literature, but I just prefer to call it pelvic venous compression. And I'm going to show you uh, why this is becoming more common. Uh, it was thought that only young women with what was called May Thurner syndrome would have pelvic venous compression. And May Thurner syndrome was described by two physicians, May and Thurner, as this right iliac artery compressing the left iliac vein as it joins the iliac confluence into the vena cava. And it was thought to be very rare. This was thought to be a zebra unicorn kind of diagnosis. And we had no real way to make this diagnosis. It doesn't show up consistently on CT scan. It doesn't show up consistently on um, MRI or MRA or MRV. And venograms often look normal in these patients. But there are multiple choke points. So it's not only just the, this confluence here, but there are multiple cho choke points where our iliac arteries or branches of the iliac arteries impinge upon the iliac vein and cause significant compression. And until the development of intravascular uh, ultrasound, or IVUS, we were never able to identify these uh, compression points. So I tell patients and my referring doctors, IVUS has, is like giving me the Hubble telescope. I can see things in arteries and veins that we absolutely never knew existed. They don't show up on venograms. They don't show up on arteriograms, but it's dramatic. So here's a catheter in the inferior vena cava, and we're pulling the catheter down, and we're going to see the iliac veins branch. Here's the left iliac vein, and you're going to see it get squashed by the iliac artery right here. It's almost completely obliterated, and then the artery falls away, and the vein comes back toward normal. So that's a non-thrombotic, quote, May Thurner syndrome, what I just call pel pelvic vein compression. And the um, device has a very nice little roller bar. We can measure the area of the vein. We know that the iliac vein is supposed to be roughly 200 millimeters squared in diameter, I'm sorry, in area, to allow adequate drainage. And so with stenting, I think we started, I think we started at 73 millimeters squared here, and with stenting, we're up to 230 millimeters squared. And that will drain the obstructed leg. Um, this is sort of a cartoon diagram of how the vein can be flattened and flattened and pounded by the heavy muscular artery so, so badly that there's intraluminal scars and webs and synechiae that obstruct the uh, flow. So even though there might be small channels, it's not adequate enough to drain the leg. So here's an example where the catheter is in one of these small channels, but not even the sum of these channels can adequately drain the leg. These channels have to be uh, disrupted with high pressure balloons and then stented. Now here's a guy that I thought was one of my most spectacular cures, and he turned out to be more of a humbling lesson. 
He presented two days before Christmas, three years ago, with a massively bleeding vein. When EMS came to get him, they were going to call the police because there was so much blood in his bathroom. Um, he's, he weighs about 280 pounds. He's a big, just a big, muscular, heavy guy. And uh, I thought it was pretty cool. I, I sutured this bleeder up. I um, injected the uh, perforating vein below. And then I brought it back the day after Christmas. And we laser ablated the saphenous vein and took out these varicose veins. And off he went, happy camper. Three years later, he comes back and says, Doc, why does my leg look worse? Well. Now I know why his leg looks worse. I, didn't, I wouldn't have known then, but now that we have Ibis, his leg looks worse because his iliac vein is completely crushed by the iliac artery. Hit the area of his iliac vein was only 44 millimeters squared. And yet his venogram, you know, it, there's slow flow here, but you don't really see the obstruction. So with a balloon and a stent, now he's up to 240 millimeters squared. The contrast flows through br briskly, and I I'm, I'm hope I'm not giving you another humbling story three years from now, but I think now he really is cured, and I think his varicose veins and the venous hypertension in his leg really were, the ca were caused by this pelvic compression, not de novo reflux. Here's another example. This patient has a, a obviously swollen left leg, and he had had five episodes of cellulitis over the, pre, over the previous 12 months, in and out of the hospital, IV antibiotics, no varicose veins, no history of DVT. But this just looks like a swollen, heavy, angry leg. And again, pelvic venous compression. His iliac vein is open, but it's scarred, it's stretured, it's encased in scar tissue. And by opening up the vein and relieving the venous hypertension, he heals the skin, the edema goes away, and the cellulitis doesn't come back. So this is a very nice uh, result of bilateral pelvic venous decompression. You can see uh, the, the swelling, the pebbling. The, you can just tell that leg doesn't feel good. And this is less than 30 days later. So I tell my referring docs or anybody that'll listen, when you see legs like this, legs that they, they look terrible, they look like they hurt, they're debilitating, uh, patients can't walk, uh, but yet they've had uh, years of scans that have shown no DVT. The cause is up in the pelvis, and now we can fix it. So uh, here's an example of uh, probably a unicorn, I would say, and one of my most grateful patients. She'd been in a wheelchair completely unable to walk for one year. Her history goes back seven years. She was on high-dose steroids for uh, autoimmune disorders, and she got a lung abscess, was in the ICU, and developed a small clot in her calf. And really unbeknownst to her, because she was unconscious, uh, somebody put an IVC filter in her. And so I'm looking at these legs, and I mean, she's got everything there, right? Every diagnosis that I've shown you, she's got. Um, and so I did a CT scan of her pelvis, and here is her spine, here's her aorta, and this is the filter inside her IVC. The filter and the IVC are totally clotted and fibrosed. Uh, the, just for reference, the IVC should be twice the size of the aorta here. So that's basically one centimeter, and it should be two and a half centimeters in diameter. And when looking at her iliac arteries, which show up in white here, you cannot see any iliac vein whatsoever. So she's uh, one of the most dramatic examples of pelvic obstruction and lower extremity venous hypertension. So with uh, a lot of patients uh, uh, and a lot of endovascular work, I can get catheters and wires through uh, what really looks like, um, well, it's very, very challenging anatomy because there's, there's really no lumen here. And with very high pressure balloons, crush that old filter out of the way and put very large stents in the inferior vena cava and provide drainage. Now I want to show you what she looked like the next morning. She had a spontaneous four liter diuresis in less than 24 hours. So um, these patients are out there and they can be uh, helped dramatically with some of the new endovascular techniques. Um, I will tell you that she went from being completely non-ambulatory to walking with a walker, to walking with a cane, to being fully functional about three months after the procedure. Thank you. I'm not going to really go over lymphedema because it's, 
been discussed uh, before, but it is in the differential diagnosis of a, sw of a swollen leg. I am going to show you one great case, though, that highlights something I learned from Dr. Bartholomew, and that is Stemmer's sign. So here's a woman that had a, a pelvic tumor. She had radiation, and she survived the tumor but developed this massive right lower extremity swelling. And when you get down onto her toes, here's the classic Stemmer's sign. You can easily pinch skin off the top of the second toe on her left leg, which is normal, but the toe on her right foot, which is involved with the lipedema, uh, you know, is very slippery and you just can't pinch that skin. Uh, the treatment for lymphedema probably lags a little bit behind that of some of the other vascular disorders. Uh, we're, you know, at least in my area, I'm stuck still with decongestive therapy, compression garments, and pneumatic compression devices. So I like to end with my talk to my referring physicians uh, with lipidemia because they've never heard of it. And so I go through various stages and various examples and you know, briefly tell them what I've learned about lipidema and uh, wh how this fat is different than calorie-induced fat. And this is a picture of Dr. Stutz doing liposuction in Bavaria. He was kind enough to have me uh, over for a few days last year. And uh, so I think to, for my referring docs, I tell them the biggest thing you can do is diagnose it, tell your patient what they have, and then they can go uh, read more about it and find a, a specialist. So I think the role of a vascular surgeon is kind of unique in lower extremity swelling. We're in a, in a very good position to diagnose arterial diseases, venous diseases, lymphatic diseases. We've got all the tools, the ultrasound catheters, the intravascular catheters needed to relieve either the leak or the obstruction. Um, and so uh, I like these puzzles. And thank you for coming out this morning.